Hi everyone, welcome. I'm so honored to share space with you today. Thank you for coming and spending your Saturday with me to talk about deconstructing the exhibition. This side up is an exhibition that is centered on visibility and bringing renewed attention and awareness to the often invisible craftsmanship that happens inside of museums. Um, and it really was designed and conceived to kind of visually prioritize and celebrate the labor that happens in the kind of broader art network. So the exhibition quite literally reflects this kind of exposing or deconstructing the exhibition model. Uh, we've peeled away the drywall, not actually, it's a facade, but uh, you know, we're trying to show the <coughs> framing, the behind the walls, it's almost like an exhibition inside out. So part of the kind of methodology, what we're gonna go into today, so I wanted to give you a little bit of a background about what the exhibition is for those of you who might, this might be your first time visiting it. And then we're gonna go into the behind the scenes, we're gonna go into the making of the conception, the iterative design process, all of the correspondence with artists, um, and then the final execution. So again, we're really trying to demystify this process that can seem quite elusive um, and that's part of its allure right you go into an exhibition space and everything's beautifully lit um, it's hung you don't even you can't see any of the hanging mechanisms and it has this just kind of magic presentation it's almost like you know a movie or set production and we're doing the opposite of that. We want to look at all of the hanging hardware. We're right in front of this mount wall. Um, and we want to talk about all of the people who are skilled and have um, you know, this really honed process and material intelligence that makes this possible. So we start out in uh, an installation by Vivian Chu. It's a collaboration between um, two fifth generation uh, Hong Kong to New York City um, artists and kind of art workers. One is Vivian Chu, a woodworker who um, is known for fine furniture making, um, came out of RITZ and Columbia MFA programs. And the other is Mei Loom, who is the fifth generation owner of the oldest continuously operating porcelain import store in Manhattan's Chinatown. They came into contact while uh, Vivian was in New York City, and this beautiful collaboration was born. They, the, the shop has been uh, importing ceramics from Jindajin, Hong Kong, all these kind of major porcelain centers across China, um, and actually greater Asia um, as well. And um, they've been doing this since 1890 and they have these incredible crates. They've been collecting all of the ephemera and kind of material byproducts of that, um, of that import and of, of their store. Um, and they've been holding on to the materials that you see in the space acting as pedestals, these crates since 1945 in their basement in Manhattan. And uh, May, who is you know in her early 30s and is now running the operation, doing all of these porcelain import um, sourcing trips for her family, uh, decided she wanted to start a ceramic residency and needed a lot of room. So she wanted to deaccession all of these crates, which have a lot of sentimental value. They have all of these markings that show their migration from Hong Kong, all of the stamps that they've collected along the way, and their final destination, which is the Wing On Loan Company shop. So they needed to find the right steward to give the crates to, and once she saw Vivian's woodworking, she thought that she found the right person. Vivian is one of uh, just a handful of folks who has uh, completed traditional apprenticeship in coopering, which is a barrel making technique. So, 
understands how to make vessels and bends lots of wood into these kind of undulous vessel forms. And Vivian ended up taking all of the crates, shipping them to her new studio in Richmond, and built this entire body of work, which is on view for the first time in this exhibition. So it's really a celebration of this kind of shared intergenerational migration and the passage of you know, these art objects, but also their families um, across space of time. So you're meant to feel like you're kind of behind the wall, maybe inside of a crate. Um, when we first finished uh, painting and building the framing in this room, somebody remarked that, oh my gosh, you took all the drywall down. And people still think that when they walk in, <laughs> which is exactly what we were intending to do. We really wanted it to feel like you're in this behind the scenes moment. So the, the kind of arc of the exhibition goes from object, which leaves the artist studio, of course, goes in transit through freight systems or art, art shippers, and then it lands in these institutional kind of behind the scenes spaces. Like I keep referring to it as the bowels of the museum. So you're in the back behind the scenes prep rooms, uh, fabrication studios, conservation studios, all of the places that as a visitor you don't see. So we're moving from shipping into this kind of behind the scenes space. This was the kind of second uh, mode of the exhibition here. And this is a new body of work by Adam Manley, who um, is a fine woodworker as well, the head of the woodworking program at San Diego State University. And much of his career has been interested in containers. So he teaches reliquary making across the country uh, at many craft schools, including Aeromont and Penland. And he's really interested in this idea of containment and value and objects having such, uh, such high and prestigious value that they need these hyper-specific containers built to protect them. So he's always thought of crates as these kind of utilitarian reliquaries. Um, and for this body of work, he was interested in building these utilitarian reliquaries for all of the invisible infrastructure that you see uh, that, that is in these behind the scenes spaces in museums. So dollies, mop buckets, framing tools, step stools, uh, measuring tapes. Uh, right here we see a really amazing acquisition. Um, these are from the 40-year head preparator of the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York. He's an artist himself and uh, every time he acquired a new tape measure he would either etch into it or paint it. Um, he has a vibrant studio practice in his own right. Uh, but to mark that it was his tape measure, so he would know if anyone had taken his tools. And then we're moving into this kind of threshold space. We have the open framework, which we're kind of sitting within. And you walk under the tape measuring curtain, which is, you know, again, we're, we're moving into the active installation uh, area. So. We're thinking about art handlers, preparators, conservators, um, all of the people who are doing that kind of behind the scenes, active creative production. We have, uh, oh, sorry, I'm gonna tell, tell you a little bit more about the tape measuring curtain and the, the floor drawing. So we have a bodies of work here by Willem de Haan, who's based in the Netherlands, and he is an art handler and shipper who has uh, kind of fell into it because of his vehicle, he says. He has a really huge van and it's perfect for <laughs> moving artwork. And he became the de facto fine art shipper um, in Brussels, Paris, um, Rotterdam. So he kind of fell into this practice because he is an artist himself and knows how to handle work. And now he um, is making, has a very self-reflexive practice about all these space, institutional spaces he's working in. So he did a, a really in, incredible floor drawing for us in a clay crayon that's used in uh, construction for marking. So it's not made of wax. Um, the fact that it's clay-based makes it not smear, which is perfect for this kind of um, installation. And he interpreted an early drawing we sent him, which I'll show you later on in the slides, 
uh, in to scale to show how off it was. So again, we're trying to show all of these little, all of the, the creative production and that those little technical drawings you swap back and forth between departments, from curator to artist, artist to curator, um, artist to framer, mount maker, all of these people just to communicate these ideas. Um, and he translated it into physical scale here. And then we move into Clinton Lowry's work. Clinton is the founding editor of Art Handler Magazine. Um, it's a publication that was started in 2015 and 2016 as this newsprint publication. It kind of moved onto the internet um, and all of the volumes are available online um, as PDFs. And then the attended social media page became this really viral um, space, has a lot, a huge following, um, and people follow to see all of this behind the scenes labor, and, all, and he commissions writers um, who work in, as who are art workers, who are art handlers, to kind of elucidate, bring visibility to um, this behind the scenes. So I think in an interesting way, the magazine is doing what the exhibition was really intending to do um, in this kind of decentralized, readily accessible format that's slightly less experiential than this space. Here we see the art handling magazine. And a beautiful, um, one of the things about exhibitions that I wish I had known um, before I became a curator is that there, not everything is so predetermined. Sometimes you have happy accidents that happen in the space. Um, you know, we're really involved in, we're kind of in the business of context. So putting things into a certain context, putting two things next to each other so that that affinity gives it new meaning or builds a relationship between those things. Um, and here um, in the original schematics for the exhibition, we had the art handler stacks um, and they just happened to overlap with Willem's drawing. And there's this really nice formal connection between the markings for where the tape measure would be and the kind of graphic on the front of the newsprint. And then we're here, uh, kind of where we are right now, we have their digital gallery attendant who um, all of this upcycled kind of crate furniture was, was built for um, a fake gallery booth. Um, so it was kind of this conceptual exercise where you know, the main byproduct of all of these art fairs is an enormous amount of crates. If you um, have ever been to any of these kind of big fairs, there's usually a room or an entire hallway that's filled with crates. Um, and John uh, Powers and William Kauhida kind of upcycled them into furniture, um, kind of a long tradition of, you know, I think you've seen on Pinterest or um, in other DIY spaces, you know, making making a table or a coffee table out of a pallet or something like that. And it's this kind of cheeky um, take on what it takes, uh, kind of bringing visibility to that invisible infrastructure and all of these people who make it happen. And then we're here at the Mount Wall. Um, and again, this is really a celebration of mount makers who are almost always esteemed metalsmiths or blacksmiths in their own right, and um, apprentice and, and spend a lot of time honing their craft in mount making to be able to make these highly specialized pieces of equipment, right? They have to support and hold an object for a, you know, a long period of time without adding more pressure points, um, without um, injuring the piece. Um, it also has to blend in. So we have mounts that are painted to the exact um, kind of finish and color of the wall or the piece or both so that they kind of completely disappear. Um, and the intention here was to show the mounts uninterrupted um, without the objects they were designed to hold so that you can really see the skill and the kind of really sculptural quality of the mounts themselves. Again, we have another kind of happy accident. Um, Willem, uh, the documentation of two of the pieces that are in the show, the uh, crate 
suitcases, uh, which he used to transport his artwork here, built to the proprietary dimensions of British Airways. He couldn't even make the pieces until we had booked his flights, which is another great thing. Um, and he's made these crates in the past to uh, be able to bring work to international shows. Um, and then he, uh, we worked with a framer um, in Houston named Mason, um, and he delivered the frames with all of this saran wrap and pearl wrap around the edges, this immense attention and care. And Willem decided to, that he was going to kind of appropriate Mason's, or draw attention to Mason's craftsmanship uh, with the frames and keep the saran wrap and all of the packing material in the final display. Again, um, a, a wonderful piece where we have uh, work about our handling by John Riepenhoff. These are paper mache legs that has a built-in cleat behind it, and they typically hold 2D works, paintings, uh, drawings that are framed. And uh, in a conversation with someone, uh, with a collector here in town, he mentioned that he was, we talked about the show, and he mentioned that he had, he was about to acquire the art handler legs. So we had a wonderful conversation with the gallerist, the artist, and, um, and we talked about what he could, what the legs could potentially support and act as infrastructure for within this exhibition. So we sent him the checklist, we had a couple of meetings, and uh, he honed in on Adam's work and really wanted to, to see this Minge Museum step ladder piece uh, in conversation with his own work. And then we um, put the two artists together and they were able to discuss how it would, uh, how it would be presented in its final form. Okay, so I wanted to give you a little bit of background about why I decided to curate this exhibition, why this is of interest to me. Um, I am in a really unique position of being a curator who has a lot of art handling experience. Um, and I have worked as an art handler and um, kind of an in-house preparator for a number of institutions. And for me, all of these behind the scenes interactions uh, that I was able to um, to get from those experiences really highlighted the immense craftsmanship and material intelligence that happened in the behind the scenes that most people who see exhibitions don't ever get to experience. So, you know, often there will be an artist who comes, uh, comes to an installation and says, this is my vision, this is exactly how I want it to, to be, but I don't know how to hang it. I don't actually know how to make it do that. Um, I want it to float off the ground. I want to build a giant altar in the middle of the room, but how do I do it? Help. And the art handlers tend to be the, the kind of translators who make it take that last jump. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, they really become thought partners for the artists and help them make, make the work uh, a reality. So this is what a visitor sees. Um, beautifully lit, kind of everything staged, perfect. It just looks really intentional. Um, and then I wanted to show you the kind of behind the scenes hustle bustle of what actually goes into it. Um, an immense number of people and hands and tables and all of the kind of outside infrastructure, carts and dollies um, that, that actually go into making it happen. So these are a couple of previous projects I've worked on and I wanted to show you the kind of, um, the process so that I could give you some insight into why I decided to do this exhibition. So here is another um, exhibition that I did the exhibition design for and um, I wanted to show you the kind of iterative design process that we went through to get to this final pedestal form. So it started with me looking at the columns, taking a bunch of photos in the space, and then kind of tracing them, thinking how great would it be if we could build a forest that shows the material that the baskets were made from? What if we repeated this column form throughout and they became the, the structure to show the work? Um, and then I met with a fabricator and a woodworker that I was working with at the time, Loved the idea. We went through it. We put it all into SketchUp, 
um, into this kind of cat funky rendering. And they were like, it might fall on people. If this doesn't work, it's way too top heavy. Um, you can't do this. It will, you know, this is dangerous. So this is just an example of, you know, this is kind of the exhibition design vision where we started. This is the kind of cat version. This is it in, in the studio being worked on. And then we realized we couldn't fit the table or the pedestals through the front door. Um, so we had to wheel it through the, through the downtown of Asheville, North Carolina to be able to bring it into a different door. So we got some funny pictures of that happening too. Again, um, another behind the scene kind of, this is what you see, you get to experience this incredible three-dimensional weaving. And then in the behind the scenes, there's like six people on ladders, all clamoring to make it happen. So why craft? Why this institution? Um, again, we're talking about curatorial work. It's very attuned to context and making physical relationships between objects. Um, and so as the curator of Houston Center for Contemporary Craft, my, you know, the lens that I'm looking at is why does it need to be a contemporary craft institution? And um, for us, we have a, you know, a pretty expansive lens about what craft entails, um, but it has this particular attention and connection to process, materiality, skills, sharing, community, um, and often is, you know, tied to many, many generations of kind of apprenticeship and generational knowledge that's passed down. And I felt like, um, you know, having been inspired to show this kind of behind the scenes creative production, um, it was really important for me to frame it within the craft discipline. Um, all of the people that I have worked with in this field have such uh, high technical skill, um, material knowledge, and um, the attention to process and kind of hand wrought production in the space is kind of bar none. So I felt like it was important to show it in this space. So. I put a quote from the Journal of Curatorial Studies about how um, the curatorial methodology has evolved over time. Um, like we said, arranging objects, and now it's a little bit more performative. Maybe it's a little bit, it's in an expanded context, um, and hopefully it might have some kind of catalytic potential, revolutionary potential to change people's minds, um, open people up to new ideas. So I wanted to talk about the methodology that I came into building this show with um, and how I was thinking about it in a kind of more expanded context. Um, again, another um, quote by, from, from a text called Ways of Curating by Hans Ulrich Oberst. And thinking about um, curators and art workers in this kind of extended network, this larger ecosystem of art worlds and um, how we interact with each other has this kind of really networked um, quality um, and it's all, it's very relational. So it's not only about the relationships between the objects in the space, but it's also about building relationships with living artists um, building relationships with other art, art workers, archivists, all of this kind of expanded field. So, I wanted to bring a kind of this networked relational methodology to the project. And what kind of inspired this is the, the way that art handlers, um, what, what I noticed in hiring art handlers for projects, was that they, they're so humble and they would always say, I would tell them what the project was and they would say, oh, I know a guy who's better for that. Um, and I'd be like, you don't want the job? <laughs> and they were like, no, I know someone who is the best person at hanging vinyl. I know the person who is the best like fabricator for welding. Um, and so it's a really, uh, 
there's a community um, that is really uh, supportive and um, mutually beneficial. And I think that the kind of word of mouth network of kind of um, experts who all really admire each other's craft is also very aligned with craft communities um, and what I've noticed um, working in the field of craft. So I wanted it to kind of take on a similar methodology to how it is working in the art handling field. So I started with Art Handler Mag because I felt like the project that they were doing was really encapsulating that kind of networked methodology in and of itself. So they have, um, beyond the Instagram, another uh, website called jobs.art that posts art handling jobs. Um, and what I really think that Clinton Lowry, the artist behind all of this, all of this practice is doing is being this network, this node, this kind of connector um, that's really uniting this really immense, um, oft, often invisible league of immensely skilled people. So I started with talking to Clinton about the show um, and thinking about a methodology where I asked artists or art handlers who I knew were um, doing work in this realm who they would recommend for the show um, and who, who they were thinking of and whose work they were excited about. So <clears throat> I started with making this kind of vision board of artists that I knew were working in this realm. You see, not all of these people are in the show, but many of them are. So this was my original pitch deck that I, uh, that I presented to our director when I first started and said, this is, this is my idea. I want to show exhibition furniture making, crate building, mount making, and these are artists who I think are doing really amazing things in those realms. Um, and this was my, this was my like, thesis statement in the pitch deck, <laughs> why I think it's important, why uh, I want to frame this kind of discourse within craft. And then once the show was okay and we got it on the calendar, we started making the show. So um, I, I also want to say, you know, part of my impetus for making this show, but also doing an exhibition, uh, doing a lecture that further kind of bring, deconstructs or demystifies the process is because um, I think as, a, a, as an aspiring art historian and curator, someone who has walked into art spaces and been deeply moved and transfixed and um, and taken with the works of art on display in, in institutions growing up, um, I would have loved to see one of these. So it's like kind of like I'm passing on a service to my, uh, my younger self um, and what it, what it takes and what it looks like for at least one person to, to make an exhibition happen. Um, I think that struck me in the panel that we had during the opening weekend because Adam mentioned, uh, the artist who made those crates, mentioned that part of his impetus for making the work was wanting to make a crate that's so perfect and beautiful and intuitive that the person handling it, it would be like a service to them, um, like kind of a nod and a pay it forward. So. I, I kind of want this lecture to be something similar in the, in the curatorial realm. Okay, so then we meet with the education department and the interpretation department, and we kind of talk about what are the big goals of the exhibition? What do we want people to learn? What, what's the big why? Um, and my key message was there are cross people and makers in museums that build exhibitions and facilitate the art viewing experience, and they are often unseen. So that was the kind of big goal. And then uh, breaking through these, uh, breaking down the sub goals and kind of what I wanted to do helped me, um, helped me with the process of laying out the exhibition, figuring out the flow, the kind of narrative arc, what, how each space was supposed to help tell that story. 
Um, these are some early scrawling, <laughs> scrawled drawings in my notebook of what, where I wanted things to be, um, how the flow, and I kind of, in this um, madness here was when I was like, oh, it needs to be the flow, like, the, it needs to mimic the journey of an art object from studio to preparing spaces, kind of the back behind the scenes of museums, and then kind of end in the expanded field and in the kind of white cube. Um, so this kind of uh, iterative process of research and kind of thinking about what the goals were led me to the rest of the design. Okay, so once we got to that stage, I started mocking everything up in SketchUp. So I used software to make miniature versions of all the objects, well, this and Photoshop, um, to scale in the space in kind of the manner that I was thinking I wanted to, to present the work. Um, and this is kind of an early iteration. You see that not everything's exactly where I thought it was going to be, um, but it, it kind of sticks to it. Um, and in my original kind of research, I thought that I wanted the first room to feel like that color of the back of drywall, that kind of cardboard color. And then in this room, I wanted it to feel like sheetrock, um, like the walls are starting to come up. And so another piece of the process that nobody ever hears about is I got like 15 paint samples and was you know going crazy at the paint store trying to get the perfect shade of sheetrock and the perfect shade of drywall cardboard um, <laughs> but here you can see the kind of thinking behind that here's another image um, that kind of shows an in in process of what this looks like and in design um, this is where i'm scaling the image the images um, from the checklist and um, you can see in that top left corner, our original design was going to be this kind of big mound of crates in the center. Um, it was going to be this kind of just like monumental thing that you circumnavigate. And how we had a conversation and then ended up moving to this like a more ordered kind of presentation that you can see I'm working on here. And it kind of ends in this iteration, which is pretty close to how it, how it actually came to be. Okay, so we have the exhibition plans, we have all the artists on board. Um, I, you know, used that methodology to find some of these artists. I used Clinton to find Willem, I used Adam to find Vivian, um, I used Dimitri uh, Tom Ludis to find Galen Boone, uh, and all of these mount makers recommended each other. Um, I have to say the mount makers were the most humble of everyone. They were like, you know who makes the best mounts? This person. I shouldn't even be in the running. Like, this person is the ultimate mount maker. You have to show their mounts. Um, so uh, here we're in kind of execution. So here is a screenshot from a studio visit where Vivian was kind of, had figured out the faceting process. So I think I mentioned earlier that she was trained in uh, coopering, which is barrel making, but found that she couldn't steam bend the slats because the wood is so old and damaged, it had water damage, it had termite damage. So it was just crumbling when she was trying to do what she had originally intended to do. And then she in invented this faceting technique where essentially she creates slots and then figures out all the angles to then re-glue it together to look like it's been bent into shape. So this was us having a, an aha moment uh, on Zoom where she's like, I figured it out and this is the best one I've ever made. Uh, it's it's been glued <coughs> together. And then um, of course we had to figure out how to get all of the work on site here in Houston. So I took a trip with, uh, with, a sh with an art handling friend um, who helped me bring a lot of the objects, but we also did some, some research. So our first stop was Wing On Loan Company in Chinatown, New York. 
We went to the shop, met with May, got to see all of the behind the scenes family archival photos, and Vivian had been wanting uh, some images and, um, and for us to collect some rosewood stands because in her home and in the, uh, in the home she grew up in and in the shop, it's important for all of the porcelain vessels to be elevated. And so most of the times you see these kind of carved uh, rosewood stands underneath them. So she wanted to see these, so we were kind of doing research. I was sending her a bunch of pictures. This is how much they cost. These are different shapes you can get. Um, and we ended up bringing a huge amount of them to her studio. Here you can see some of those archival photos that we looked at with, with May in the top left corner here. Um, these are the actual crates that you're seeing in the exhibition. These are, uh, this photo is from around 1982. It's in front of a storefront in Hong Kong about to be shipped, which is a really amazing kind of document to have. And then this was when I landed in Vivian's studio in Richmond, Virginia with those vessels, uh, those vessel stands and kind of took pictures of her process, which is not done on a computer. It's all done on graph paper like this. This is how she measures all those angles and figures out the kind of uh, undulations that she needs. And you can see some of the works in progress here. <clears throat> so in this trip, we picked up all of the crates that we wanted to use as pedestals. It was important for Vivian to have them elevated and, um, you know, presented in a way that was not like a, not like a normal crate, obviously. She's done so much, imbued so much labor and time and care into them, but she didn't want it to be so divorced from, um, you know, just plopped into a white gallery context where it feels really sterile and devoid of context. So we talked a lot about what kind of strategies we could use for display and she wanted to use the crates that she hasn't transformed into vessels yet as the pedestals. So I picked up all the pedestals, um, and then we made another stop along the way and picked up um, a few of the crates that Adam had made uh, during our residency. So this was the first shipment, and then of course we had an expanded um, field of fine art shippers and, and other folks who brought the work on site. This piece uh, that I was telling you about earlier, again, came from that kind of relational networked uh, methodology. Again, just talking about the show with people in the field and finding out that uh, one, of, uh, one of my friends and a, and a wonderful colleague in town had collected these and it was in his collection and in his living room being used. So we were able to go and collect those from his, from his space. We stole his whole living room for the exhibition. <laughs> and this is the, the earlier work that Adam had been producing. Again, you can see this side up is scrolled on the side. This piece just got acquisition into the Museum of Fine Arts Boston collection. But a lot of his work is about containment um, and has been kind of revolving around this space for a long time. So part of the way that this happened was uh, that Adam made a list of institutions that were collecting or showing um, furniture and craft that he admired and kind of hoped his work would be in one day and wanted and asked for prep objects from them. So we kind of made this like dream list and then this is the list of folks that ended up participating. Um, but we were in contact with all of these prep departments, conservators, framers, um, so they're really involved in the project. That hammer here from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, um, it was carved and shaped to the, to the size of the preparator's hand, so it's his personal piece, um, so the shaft really fits him. Um, and then here you can see us playing in the space with how it, how, what angle it needed to be on. So it's this kind of funny meta person behind the fake person holding the object. <laughs> um, and here's where we're kind of staging the exhibition. We had a whole conversation about this piece on the right and how um, 
it probably wouldn't, you know, we wanted to show the top of it because it has all of these great uh, stampings on it. And, but, a, a, you know, someone uncreating it would never put the foam side against the wall. So we had to, we had a whole conversation about how it would actually happen and how the display could be true to the process. And this is the original version. Um, Willem had done a piece where he was sent the drawing on the right and recreated it in raw clay uh, in the space. Um, and you can see a, a detail of it on the left. Um, again, this, this was his second iteration of that piece, both in clay. And here you can see the incredible drawings, um, construction drawings, uh, and our floor plan that were done by our lead preparator um, and facilities manager, Iva Kinnaird. So you can see all of the kind of labor that went into constructing the, the fake walls um, and or, or the fake, you know, the, fra the, the real framing, but the, the kind of fake drywall and all of those kinds of effects. Um, and I've constructed all of these on site. This is another drawing that I, that I nabbed from that installation of Graham Bell, who's one of the fantastic art handlers on site, figuring out the spacing for the mount wall. Um, so this was uh, hung up on the wall and um, he was figuring out the spacing between each piece. And I thought, again, it kind of shows those quick technical drawings that happen on site. Here's another version of that um, where we're trying to figure out what the framing should be like, how much spacing between everything, and the framer, Ian Gerson, and Patrick Renner were making notes on the bottom. So I wanted to kind of show all of the ephemera of the, the process. Here you can see the making of the, of the floor drawing. Um, Willem created a scale grid, one meter squares across this entire gallery and uh, mocked mocked that original floor drawing up in, within that grid. Um, and then here you can see on the right, he built maquettes for the steel fabricator out of cardboard, which I brought so that I can show you. <clears throat> I think the, the kind of craftsmanship and artistry that went into even building these maquettes is quite something. Um, this is the maquette for the uh, for the mount that holds the, the tape measuring curtain, there's a steel uh, ballast underneath it. And then uh, this is that kind of steel frame that he made to hold the pencil and the drawing. The artist thought it was crazy the whole time. I was collecting all of their notes and drawings and, and all of this stuff. Um, and another kind of inside insight into the process was that everyone kept coming in during it and asking, is it, it looks done, is it, it's done, right? Because since we started, the whole thing looked like it was in progress. So it was this kind of performance of making a show look like it was being made and when, at what point is it finished, you know? Here we are unpacking the Wally Beshti piece. Uh, this is a tempered glass box that's made to the proprietary dimensions of, of FedEx crates. Um, of FedEx boxes, um, which FedEx owns those dimensions. Um, and he ships them in through FedEx in the boxes to galleries. And this is kind of a behind the scenes of, of the uncreating of that and the placement. Um, again, much like Vivian's crates, all of the kind of accrued cracking um, and kind of traces, the way bills on the front of the, the the cardboard really show this trace of movement and trace of labor. It's really bringing visibility to these larger systems at work that support art infrastructure. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about the community element. Um, so much of the art handling, pro the process of building this show, the process of finding these artists and, and ha finding these thought partners was um, was this communal communal element and um, this mutually supportive network. So once they all came on site for installation, we were so lucky to 
partner with a couple of other institutions in town. These are behind the scenes images from the Manil. We got some great, uh, great tours of the framing shop and the, and the prep spaces. Let me see more. And we also got to see the behind the scenes of the conservation department at the MFAH. And here you, you see the kind of uh, motley crew of, of on-site artists and art handlers on the right. And so to highlight the community element and the fact that it takes so many hands to build an exhibition, um, it is such a collaborative effort. Um, we, made, we installed this credit wall here, uh, which you can see as you walk out of the exhibition, that shows every person who touched or was involved with this exhibition. Um, steel fabricators, the shippers, the copy editors, the, trans, the Spanish translator, our graphic designers, um, all of the lenders that, that so graciously lent us work for the show, artist assistants, all of our art handlers, um, our fabricators. So I just wanted to highlight the, the community element and segue that into saying that we are hosting the first uh, the inaugural Texas Art Handling Olympics. Um, in 2010, the New York City Art Handling community started uh, the Olympic competition, the Art Handling Olympics, in the Lower East Side. And it was this kind of really riotous event with um, hilarious competitions like static hold, holding like a concrete painting while a fake curator yells at you to move it an inch to the left or right or unboxing um, a crate that is filled with installation elements with no instructions. Um, so it's really this kind of insider take, this self-reflexive kind of celebration of the discipline. And we are going to be hosting it on March 7th um, with the generous support of Judy and Scott Nyquist. So please join us. Um, it's free to participate. Um, we're gonna have swag and handmade medals. We're going to have a closing ceremony under Willem's uh, tape measuring curtain. So please join us. It will be, it's going to be a fantastic night. Okay, I'm going to end it there and open it up for questions. Thank you all for being here. Does anybody have any burning questions? So there can be spectators at the March 7th? Oh yeah, spectators are encouraged. Yes. As much as this is kind of a, an exhibition that's breaking the fourth wall and has this kind of intended audience, we want the Art Handling Olympics to feel the same way, you know. So did anyone that you contacted um, about either participating or lending material, did they say, I mean, was everyone very um, enthusiastic or were there people who said, oh, yeah, I'm out, it sounds sort of crazy and I'm not interested, or what was the kind of response that you got? That's a great question. I, it was overwhelmingly mostly a positive, like, this is, I've always wanted people to see my mouth. I put so much time into them and nobody ever gets to see them, so I'm really excited about this. But a few people who, a few people I reached out to did say, I perceive this as my professional practice and I don't, I don't want to show it. And, this kind of context it's not I don't I don't think of it as my work so we had kind of both we had people who who had both kind of feelings about it um, but I would say it was overwhelmingly mostly yes please I've always wanted to show people this stuff it's a great question though yes. and I think oftentimes artists will come up with an idea and they are not kind of touched on it they don't really even know how they fully want to execute it so they're surprised by the magic that the, the handlers and the scholars are able to do. And you kind of touched on that with the piece, but I'm curious for any of the handlers really, did they have that kind of not on moment or were they just like particularly surprised at what came as like the band, like moving it from an idea to their heads to when it was like actually executed? Oh yeah, I think, um, I think that happened so much throughout the show, you know, there was, there was a lot of thought partnership that happened on site during the installation process. And I think, um, I think that's why this is nice. It's almost like the documentation for all of, 
all of the, that kind of sticky, finessing stuff that you can't capture, even in a show about capturing that. Um, but but yeah, I think you know even with Adam, um, when we were, he said he wanted to display everything on hand trucks and dollies. Um, but when we were in the space, um, you know, some of the art handlers were like, "This looks really crowded. Do you want it to be that low?" Um, you know, they they gave a lot of feedback, and he ended up hanging one piece on the wall with uh, with the help of one of our art handlers who made a cleat for it in the back, and um, he was like. I had never thought of hanging it that way. And it totally changes how I am like engaging with the work for myself. So I think, and you know, Willem with wanting to keep the kind of the saran wrap on or even Clinton and Willem, Clinton made those um, moving blanket garments and they were talking a lot about how to, how to, how to display garments. Um, for Willem, it was not as important for it to feel like there was like this body or like a spectator of, of the labor behind it. But for Clinton, that was really important. So you can see they were talking a lot about how they wanted to display the, those jackets. And for Clinton's, you know, they're kind of bolstered. They have this foam underneath and they're really kind of looming. It's, I think it's a really nice way to symbolize the kind of looming but often invisible labor in these spaces. But for Willem, he was like, I really want to show it on a pallet jack, just like as though somebody just took it off and like almost like a set prop. He was like, this is how I want to show it. So that was a great question. Thanks. All right, well, thank you so much again for being here and I'll be in the space so we can look at works together and enjoy, continue to enjoy the show. So thank you so much for coming. Thank <laughs> you.